what are we saying to a boy when we say man up or act like a man? You know, it can have a perfectly benign meaning, like, you know, do the thing that needs doing even though you don't feel like doing it. Man up, do your homework. Bit aggressive, but, you know. <laughs> um, but it, sometimes it also has a, a more sinister and harmful meaning, which is that negative feeling that you're feeling, stop expressing it. And the more you hear that, the more it starts to sound uncannily like that feeling that you're feeling, stop feeling it. Uh, and it has to come out somewhere, and quite often it comes out as anger. So you get people who, are, who get angry when they're embarrassed and angry when they're afraid and angry when uh, they're scared or angry when they're in grief. And um, when my mother died, when I was uh, 17 years old, I found that, that all that stuff about not showing stuff uh, had, had um, hobbled me uh, in terms of leaving me unprepared for bad times. Your dad had a, a phrase uh, that was uh, elicited laughter, um, nervous laughter, I can imagine. So he crouched down. Oh, yeah. Smell that and tremble. Yes. Yeah, that was, that's what he said when he was trying to be nice. Um, he would sort of crouch down and put his, his massive fist under my sort of four-year-old chin and go, smell that and tremble, boy. Smell that and tremble. And he, but it did make me laugh. You know, that was, it. that was his way of sort of being being jovial. <laughs> and I thought, oh, Daddy wants me to laugh. And boy, did I laugh. Uh, I mean, you would. <laughs> when you discovered that, that your mother's illness was terminal, one of the things, the first things you said to her was, in fact, I'm still a virgin. Yeah. I'm 17, uh, I'm still a virgin. Yeah, it, was, it seemed like, a, well, I mean, so I, I had this conversation with her, which I remember uh, extremely well, obviously, and, uh, and, I, and it's in the book. Uh, and she said, um, is there anything you want to ask me or anything that you want to tell me? And I sort of, I say in the book, you know, I felt a thousand future selves lean in with interest because what is the statement or the question that is up to that? And, um, you know, there is no such statement apart from I love you. And I didn't, I didn't really trust myself to, to say that without losing it. Um, so I, which was, and it was important that I didn't because I'm a boy and I'm strong and I don't lose it. And, but also, also, you don't want to cry on the person who's dying because it's kind of, it shouldn't really go that way around anyway. Um, that's how I felt at the time. Um, so I said, um, would it surprise you to hear that I'm, everyone talks about how I'm having sex the whole time. Would it surprise you to hear that I'm a virgin? And she started to smile, but she didn't want to look like she was taking the piss. Um, <laughs> And she said, uh, I won't say I'm surprised, I won't say I'm unsurprised, but you'll catch them up. And I said, most of my friends have got girlfriends. And she said, you'll catch them up and overtake them in everything. Uh, which is a hell of a thing to hear uh, at that moment. Um, so, yeah, that was a good chat, really. Well, that was a lot better meeting than the meeting you'd had some moments before with your dad and stepdad, Derek, yes. when your dad broke the news to you, which which exemplifies his attitude towards the nuances of emotion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I knew that she was extremely ill, but I didn't know exactly how ill. I hadn't, uh, nobody had told me, and I hadn't asked. Um, so at that point, I came in from school. I was in the lower sixth form. Uh, came from school. I saw Dad's van parked outside. He was around the table with uh, my stepdad, Derek, uh, and he sat me down. He said, now then, boy, uh, uh, mummy's poorly, it's terminal. And that's how he told me. And he'd had a couple of drinks and he was sort of, his eyes were bloodshot. And he actually, he was actually angry um, about it because, you know, it, it felt like somebody had to make this common sense. Somebody has to face facts here. Then he immediately started talking about whether Derek needs to get a cleaner. He was looking around the kitchen and going, uh, Oh, mate, you probably, you'll probably want to need to get a cleaner because it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to keep a place clean. And Derek, Derek looked around and going, well, this is it, yeah. And then, Dad, you know, my, I, I have Josie. Uh, she comes uh, a couple of times a week. What do you tend to pay Josie? Well, I give her a fiver, mate, but she'll probably want a bit more coming out here. Oh, right, yeah. And Derek's about to haggle and then notices that I'm crying. Uh, and that, but the, the, it was just classic transference. You need to talk about, you can't possibly talk about the the disaster that's about to happen. They had to start talking about uh, cleaners. There's something to be said, by the way, for stoicism and grace under pressure and, you know, and hiding your feelings occasionally when you're in the company of, when you're doing it for other people. If somebody, if you go to the pub and your best friend tells you he's got a very serious 
illness, you're not allowed to cry on him. He's allowed to cry on you, but you don't go, oh God, Gary, what's gonna happen? You might die, oh no. You know, you are, at that point, you are the wall that that wave breaks on. It's not the other way around. So, you know, I'm not, I, I, I don't have a whole blanket, men must never hide their, hide their feelings. Of course, there are times when you've got to keep it together. Um, and women too, of course. But I'm just saying that it, it shouldn't be the, the default. Uh, the, 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 the default should be that we can talk to each other about what's bothering us, uh, as well as talk, talk to each other about what's brilliant. Um, you mentioned that you didn't feel like you were equipped to deal with your mother's death very well. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask how you've addressed that and if you think you're more resilient now. Thank you. Um, I think the counselling massively helped, um, not just for its own sake, but also giving you practice in how to, to when the subject comes up again, how to talk to normal people who are not professionals uh, about it. And also, I think as anybody who's lost someone, which is almost everyone here, knows, it's, a, it's also just a question of time. Um, you know, you never really get over a loss like that, but you do learn to make peace with it. You sort of coexist with it. There's, it's a sort of ongoing peace deal. And, um, you know, it's 27 years for me now, but, um, but still, I know on Christmas Day, she'll be there. And, you know, birthdays her death day, her birthday, you know, those days uh, and those moments, certain songs, certain smells, certain sounds, um, it never really goes away, but you, but it's time, um, but thank you. I just wanted to say a big thank you for sharing your experiences of being with both men and women when you were younger, um, because I still think there's a massive taboo and stigma attached to being bisexual, especially like yeah. as a young man. Um, so I just wondered like, what your thoughts were on that. That side of my sexuality just became less and less important to me until it sort of just not disappeared entirely, but until you know, the, the, the time when uh, marrying a woman and committing entirely to a monogamous relationship with a woman didn't seem like an issue. But then it, it shouldn't anyway, because it's not, it's not... I think there's a common misunderstanding about bisexuality. How, can you, how do you get married if you're bisexual? Surely you're tempted by twice the number of people. No, you're not tempted by twice the number of people. If you're going to be tempted, don't fucking get married. It's, you know, it's not twice the temptation. There is no temptation. You've made this extraordinary promise. You better have meant it. So, uh, so that part of my nature is not a big deal anymore. But I thought, you know, I couldn't tell the story without including it because it was, uh, it was a big part of my life as a, uh, as a teenager and a young man, as Michael Portillo put it. Uh, as a father, how has kind of gender conformity um, had an impact on you uh, and your relationships with your kids, particularly with daughters, uh, with the patriarchy and with um, uh, the inherent sexism with society? How have you been able to teach them about that? Thank you. Um, yeah, we like to think that, I mean, gender neutral parenting, I've heard it being described as um, gardening in a gale. Um, you know, there's so much in the culture uh, that it is, it's, it's very hard. But our approach has been, we, we, we didn't ban the color pink, we didn't stop them dressing up as princesses, of course not, uh, if they wanted to. We also made sure there was plenty of Lego knocking around, they dress up as knights as well, they do karate classes uh, after, after school clubs and stuff like that. And I like to think that if we'd had two boys, it would have been the same approach, that you just lay out as many options as you can. But of course, you know, they are being told all the time, boys and girls, um, that their personality, uh, uh, to some extent, is uh, dictated by what they've got in the front of their pants in a way that just isn't true biologically. Um, uh, you know, and they're told that this is, you know, you, it's, you're somehow going against the grain if you're a girl and you want to be an engineer, you're slightly going against the grain if you're a boy and you want to be, a, I don't know, a ballet dancer or a florist. And it's just a load of complete made-up nonsense. And so it's worth you know, giving them the equipment to spot it when they, to name it when they see it. I think that's not mucking about with biology, that's a straightforward duty of care. Thank you. Thank you.